Libertarianism is the theory that advocates very strict limits on government power. In past eras, many of the opponents of limited government advocated monarchy or dictatorship. Certainly that's what Nazis argued for, fascists, communists, many others. Obviously in an earlier era, the defenders of the divine right of kings. Today, however, very few people promote either dictatorship or monarchy or even a small, tight oligarchy. Uh, everybody last year loved the royal wedding, but part of the reason why people love the British royal family so much is because they actually don't have much in the way of real political power. If they were actual absolute monarchs, uh, maybe they wouldn't be as popular as they actually are. Today, most of the opponents of limited government instead argue for democracy. Uh, that is, they claim that we can afford to concentrate enormous powers in the hands of government so long as it's democratic. Why? Because a democratic government ultimately answers to the people. If the bastards in power do a bad job or they harm the public in some way, uh, then we can vote them out, elect a different set of bastards who hopefully will do a better job. Uh, however, uh, this argument for democracy, while it certainly has a lot of validity, uh, does omit a very serious problem, and that is the problem of political ignorance. In order for the public to hold the government accountable in an effective way through a democratic process, they need to have at least some reasonable knowledge of what the government is doing and what the likely effects of the government's actions are going to be. And if, in fact, uh, much of the population, most of the voters, have only very limited political knowledge and don't have enough to impose effective democratic accountability, then we have a serious problem and the case for limiting government power is strengthened. Uh, and as I'm going to suggest in this presentation, that is in fact the case. I'm going to start off talking briefly about why political ignorance matters and why we should care about it. Uh, next, I'll talk about the astounding extent of ignorance, uh, how it turns out that a very high proportion of public often has little or no knowledge of politics, often even of very basic political issues. Uh, I'll also then go on to discuss how this is not just a matter of people being stupid or poorly educated or information not being available for some reason. Rather, for most of the public, it is actually rational behavior to be politically ignorant. But unfortunately, what is individually rational often leads to bad collective outcomes for the population as a whole. Now, some scholars argue we don't need to worry very much about political ignorance, uh, that in reality, uh, people, even if they don't know very much, can use information shortcuts to offset their ignorance. I'm going to suggest that while these shortcuts do have some utility, uh, it's often overstated, and in many cases, it's actually counterproductive to try to use them. Finally, I'll talk about the implications for limited government. I'll explain how what we know about political ignorance strengthens the case for imposing tight constraints in the power of government and also for decentralizing the government that we do have that for whatever reason it's unavoidable that we need to have at least some significant government power. All of these issues I cover in more detail in a book I'm about to finish called Democracy and Political Ignorance. So I hope that if you're interested in knowing more about these matters that you will read my book and perhaps even buy it uh, when it comes out. Uh, so uh, first, why does political ignorance matter? Well, I think an obvious reason is that democracy is ruled by the people. It's supposed to be a government that's accountable to the public. And if that accountability is to work, the public needs to have some understanding of what the government is doing, what the effects are, uh, and perhaps also what the alternatives are, and that way they can at least have some rationality in deciding which set of bastards they actually want to have in power, the Democrats or the Republicans or whatever other party that uh, they might prefer. Moreover, even if you don't care about accountability for its own sake, there is still the reality that in democracies, public opinion does have a real influence on public policy. It's not the only thing that has an influence. Obviously, there's interest groups, uh, there's other factors. However, many studies show that it does have a substantial effect. And therefore, if that public opinion is poorly informed uh, or is based on ignorance or irrationality, uh, that might lead to the adoption of bad policies. Uh, and that's the second 
reason why political ignorance might matter. Uh, now, many people feel, well, uh, voters have the right to decide on the basis of whatever they want. They decide on the basis of ignorance. Well, that's just their individual right to do what they want. Uh, as Robert Bork, the famous judge and legal theorist, puts it, in some areas, the majority has the right to rule just because it is a majority. Uh, I think there's a major problem with this perspective uh, that, are, that argues, well, this is just an exercise of the individual rights of voters. And that is that when the voters make bad decisions, it's not just those who make the decision or those who are ignorant who suffer the consequences. It's all the rest of us. So if, for instance, you're ignorant about diet uh, and therefore you eat eight cheeseburgers every day under the mistaken impression that it's actually good for you, for the most part, it's just you that suffers, right? On the other hand, if you vote for bad policies that require everybody to do the equivalent of eating eight cheeseburgers every day, uh, then that imposes harms on everybody. So the fact that voting is a decision not just for yourself, but for the rest of society means that there are moral considerations reflected in your ignorance that might not occur with purely private decisions that affect only you or those who voluntarily uh, interact with you. Uh, as John Stuart Mill put it uh, 150 years ago, uh, voting can't really be considered purely as an individual right or an exercise of individual freedom because it is also the exercise of power over others is the equivalent of making other people uh, eat eight cheeseburgers a day, not just merely choosing to eat those cheeseburgers yourself. Uh, so, uh, therefore, I think there are good reasons to be concerned about political ignorance, both for those who value democratic accountability for its own sake and for those who care only just about the actual consequential effects of political decisions. Unfortunately, it turns out that a high proportion of public actually has very low political knowledge, in many cases, to an astounding degree. Uh, I'll just go through a few of the many examples that could be said of this. I go through many more uh, in my book. So, for example, right after the 2010 election, which was obviously a very important election taking place at a crucial time in our history, polls showed that only 46% of the public knew that the result result of the election was that the Republican Party had taken over the House of Representatives, but not taken over the Senate. According to most surveys, the most important issue in that election was the state of the economy. We were coming out of a very deep recession, yet 67% of the public right before the election did not even know that the economy had actually grown rather than shrank during the uh, previous year. Uh, obviously, if you're concerned about the economy and you want to vote about it in an intelligent way, it helps to at least know the basics of what's going on with the economy uh, at the time that you're casting your vote. Uh, one of the most controversial policies enacted in response to uh, the recession and financial crisis that began in 2008 was the so-called TARP bailout of the banks. Yet only 34% of voters surveyed in 2010 uh, knew that the TARP had been enacted under President George W. Bush. 47% believed that it had been enacted under President Obama. Obviously, if you're going to hold politicians and political parties responsible for the policies that they enact, it's useful to know which politicians actually enacted which policies, especially major ones like TARP, which had an over $800 billion price tag, uh, which is certainly not trivial by any measure. Uh, another major policy initiative discussed in 2009 and 2010 uh, was the so-called cap-and-trade plan uh, to try to address global warming, which uh, passed the House of Representatives in 2009 that would eventually fail. Uh, at the time that this was being debated, surveys showed that only 24% of the public knew that uh, cap-and-trade is an environmental policy. Many more people than that thought it was some sort of financial regulation. And obviously, if you don't even know that this is a policy that seeks to address an environmental issue, it's very hard for you to make any kind of intelligent judgment on whether you think it's a good policy or not. Uh, and over the last couple years, uh, obviously a very important policy uh, that has been debated extensively in the press and among the public uh, is the Obama health care plan. Various polls show that 
only 30 to 40 percent of the public believe that they understand this plan, and those numbers probably greatly overstate the true level of understanding because we know that many people are reluctant to admit to pollsters that they don't understand something. Uh, they don't want to look stupid in front of the pollsters. That's why pollsters have actually found that if you ask people their opinions on non-existent legislation, such as the Metallic Metals Act, an actual example from past surveys, people, many people will express opinions about this rather than admit that they've never heard of the Metallic Metals Act. Uh, so the same thing is true of the Obama health care plan. Not that as many people have never heard of it, but a great many people who don't know much about it probably would not, for understandable reasons, want to tell a pollster about it. Now, this kind of ignorance is not unique by any means to the last couple of years. It extends back for as long as we've had survey evidence uh, on policy issues. For example, about 10 years ago, uh, the Bush administration pushed through Congress Bush's prescription drug bill, which was the biggest new government program in American history in nearly 40 years. At the time that it was enacted, 70 percent of the public did not even know that this massive bill had actually gone through Congress, much less had an understanding of how it worked or whether it was a good idea. Uh, and there are many other similar examples that can be given. Now, ignorance extends not just to specific policies, but also to the basic structure of government and how it operates. For instance, a survey shows that only 42% of Americans can even name the three branches of the federal government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. Uh, similarly, voters often don't know which branch of government is responsible for what issues and therefore find it hard to determine uh, who to blame or credit for particular results. Uh, they also are often confused about what kinds of issues uh, are actually the result of government policy uh, or not. So they often, for instance, end up blaming incumbent politicians for things that they can't control, such as cyclical recessions, or in many cases, conditions in the world economy that national governments cannot affect. Uh, it's also the case, for instance, that uh, governments and incumbents are often punished at the ballot box, especially in farm states, for things like bad weather, which reduce uh, agricultural output, uh, or uh, in some other studies for shark attacks in coastal waters, and other things which politicians either can't control at all or at least have only very limited impact on. On the other hand, there are many other instances where public policy does have an effect on something, uh, but the public misses it because the effect is subtle uh, or indirect. Uh, now, it's worth noting that this phenomenon of political ignorance is not just a product of the current generation or of people today. Uh, older people like me often say, oh, you know, the kids today, they know nothing. They're completing their amuses compared to us. Uh, that may or may not be true. Uh, however, if you look at the last six or seven decades of public opinion polling, levels of political knowledge were roughly the same throughout most of that period as they are today. This is not a case of a steep decline that has occurred recently. This is rather a fairly stable result that has held true uh, for many years uh, and therefore cannot be attributed to some peculiarity of the current situation or to kids today playing too many video games or something. Uh, back in the days before video games, people were roughly as ignorant as they are today. Indeed, today, relative to our levels of education, we're actually perhaps slightly more ignorant uh, than uh, people were before, uh, but the differences are are small. Now, this ignorance is exacerbated by the size, scope, and complexity of modern government. Even if voters knew significantly more facts than they, most of them currently know, they still would be able to know and understand only a small fraction of the activities of the modern state. In the United States, government spending is nearly 40 percent of gross domestic product. In most European countries and other democracies, it is even higher than that. And that doesn't take account of all the extensive regulation and other activities of government. So even the best informed voters actually can only keep track of a relatively modest proportion uh, of what government does. And that makes the problem of political ignorance uh, even more severe and more dangerous uh, than it would be otherwise.
Uh, so I think it's important to recognize, though, that this ignorance is, a, is not just a result of stupidity or playing too many video games or problems in the education system or lack of availability of information. Rather, it turns out that for most voters, uh, ignorance is actually rational behavior, at least most of the time. Uh, think about voting in an American presidential election. What's the chance that your vote will actually determine the outcome? Well, studies suggest that while it varies by state, on average, the chance that uh, your vote will have an impact will determine the outcome is only about 1 in 60 million. Uh, now, in smaller elections, such as for Congress or for a local office, your chances are better, uh, but it's still usually at least many thousands to one. So, if your only reason to acquire political knowledge is to be a better voter, to know for as certain as you can that, say, Obama is better than Romney or vice versa, that turns out not to be much of an incentive to acquire political knowledge at all. You're better off putting your time and effort into things that are more likely to make a difference, and that is, in fact, what the vast majority of people seem to do. They devote only a small amount of time or sometimes no time at all to seeking out political knowledge uh, and trying to understand it. They instead devote their time to other things uh, where they have more of a chance of making a difference in their own lives uh, or perhaps the lives of other people uh, that they care about. So it turns out, therefore, that political ignorance, for the most part at least, is actually rational behavior. And this helps explain why ignorance has remained stable despite rising education levels, despite the internet and other modern media making information more available to people never before. Uh, and so forth. Uh, it turns out that the real constraint in political knowledge for most people is not the availability of information or their ability to find it or learn it. It's rather the unwillingness to take the time and effort to actually acquire more than the minimal amount of political information. Yes, there's huge amounts of information out there, but most people just don't want to use their time and effort to uh, acquire more than a small amount of it. They have better things to do with their time. Uh, now, a further implication of rational ignorance uh, is that when people do acquire political information, in most cases, it won't be for the purposes of being a better voter, but rather for other kinds of reasons. Uh, and indeed, there certainly are people who acquire political information for those reasons, just as there are sports fans like me who acquire sports information because we find it enjoyable, we like cheering on our favorite sports teams and the like. So similarly, uh, there are political political fans who enjoy acquiring information about politics. For example, I'm a big Boston Red Sox fan. I love pouring through baseball statistics, learning about the Red Sox and their opponents. It's not because I feel that I can influence the outcome of Red Sox games, though many times I wish that I could. It's just because it's fun to cheer on my team and learn more about it uh, and so forth. Similarly, uh, if you have a strong commitment to conservatism or liberalism or to Democrats or Republicans, you may well be a political fan who enjoys cheering on their political team, who enjoys hating its opponents, just as I, as a Red Sox fan, enjoy hating the rival New York Yankees. And I would actually argue it's very rational to hate the Yankees, but in general, uh, it's the fact that uh, it's part of the fan experience uh, rather than a desire or hope that you will have a significant influence on outcomes. Now, I think there's nothing wrong with people getting entertainment from being a political fan, just think there's also nothing wrong with being a sports fan. I am actually both a sports fan and a political fan myself. However, from the standpoint of political information, this does pose a challenge. If you're acting as a fan rather than as somebody trying to be a better voter, then that probably means that when you evaluate the political information that you get, you're probably not going to evaluate it in a very fair or very logical and unbiased way. Uh, just as Red Sox fans tend not to be uh, completely unbiased when they get information about the Yankees and the Red Sox, so similarly, uh, political fans tend to overvalue any information that uh, supports their pre-existing views while ignoring or discounting information that cuts the other way. Uh, so it turns out, for example, that uh, when a few years ago an experiment was done uh, where people who were 
were strong supporters of President George W. Bush. They were presented with information that, contrary to Bush's predictions, weapons of mass destruction, for the most part, were not found when the United States invaded Iraq. Uh, not only did most of these people discount that information, but a large percentage of them actually came to believe even more firmly than they did before that weapons of mass destruction actually had been found in Iraq. Uh, and there are similar experiments which show comparable results for left-wing voters. Uh, similarly, uh, when you look at people and who they talk politics with, it turns out that the vast majority of people talk politics exclusively or primarily with people that already agree with their own pre-existing views. Similarly, uh, people tend to read political media uh, or watch media that conforms to their previous views. So if you're a liberal, you will tend to read the New York Times or listen to NPR. If you're a conservative, you're very likely to watch Fox News or read read conservative media. This is exactly the opposite of the behavior that would be rational to engage in if you were seeking the truth. As John Stuart Mill famously pointed out, if you're a truth seeker, you should be seeking out opposing views to your own. Why? Because people who disagree with you are more likely to give you arguments and facts, information that you haven't heard before from your own side. Uh, however, all of this is perfectly rational behavior if what people are doing is is not acting as truth seekers, but rather acting as political fans. Uh, it's often unpleasant to have your beliefs challenged, to be exposed to opposing arguments, especially if they're at all strong or compelling, uh, and therefore people prefer uh, to have their pre-existing views validated, to act as political fans, uh, and that's fine in terms of the entertainment and personal satisfaction that they get. It's not so good uh, in terms of truth seeking. And interestingly, the people who know the most about politics uh, and those who care about it the most are more likely to act in this highly biased way uh, than people who don't care about politics very much and simply uh, are relatively ignorant. So in effect, on average, the more political knowledge you have, uh, the more sort of irrationality you actually display. Indeed, uh, economist Brian Kaplan actually we call this rational irrationality. That is that if your goal is not actually to seek the truth, but to get some kind of entertainment uh, or to act as a political fan, it's actually rational to evaluate the information that you get in an illogical way. Uh, that is, at being rational and unbiased is hard work. It's often unpleasant. It's often more fun uh, to be biased than to uh, reinforce your pre-existing views. Uh, now, I do not mean by this to suggest that people deliberately start believing things that they know not to be true. Obviously, it's actually impossible to believe something and yet know it's not true. Rather, what I'm saying is that people, when they look at political information, often make little or no effort to be rational, unbiased, or logical in the way that they evaluate the information they get. So they genuinely believe the things that they say they believe in most cases, uh, but that belief is the result of not really making much of an effort uh, to evaluate information logically, which I think is a common human failing, but it's more common in situations where the incentives to act rationally uh, are much smaller. Now, many scholars argue that despite the kind of evidence that I've just cited, uh, we don't need to worry about political ignorance too much uh, because people can use information shortcuts. Uh, sometimes there are situations where a small amount of information can serve as a stand-in for a much larger body of knowledge. Uh, and there's a variety of shortcuts that are proposed in the literature. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to go through uh, one or two of the most important ones, but if you want to read about the other ones, you should read my book, which I encourage you to do for other reasons anyway. Uh, so uh, I think information shortcuts sometimes do have some value, uh, and certainly I'm not going to suggest that they're completely useless. However, uh, they have several systematic problems. One is that you often need some kind of prior information or back background knowledge to use them effectively. Uh, secondly, even if you have a shortcut that could potentially be used effectively, uh, they often don't cure the problem of rational irrationality. Uh, that is, shortcut theories implicitly assume that people choose information shortcuts 
for the purpose of seeking the truth. Uh, but if, in fact, many people are acting as political fans rather than as truth seekers, uh, they often might uh, select shortcuts which are conducive to their entertainment value rather than conducive to actual truth seeking. For instance, one shortcut that is often proposed is the idea of opinion leaders. Instead of acquiring knowledge on your own, you defer to the knowledge of an opinion leader, somebody who knows more than you do, but perhaps shares the same values. Uh, but as it turns out, many of the people who serve as opinion leaders actually get that way, not because of their superior knowledge and insight, uh, but because they're entertaining, funny, and they're good at validating people's pre-existing views. Uh, people like Jon Stewart on the left, or Rush Wimbaugh, or Ann Coulter on the right, if you look at the kinds of things these people say, they often make numerous factual and analytical errors, but people don't watch them because they're the best possible or mo experts on their subject, or because they're especially insightful, they watch them because they're entertaining, and they do a good job of validating their audience's pre-existing views. Uh, but obviously, at the same time, they often also mislead the audience with poor analysis or uh, factually inaccurate information. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to now go into discussion of what I think is the most powerful shortcut argument, the one that's perhaps most often cited and discussed in the literature, and this is the idea of retrospective voting. What retrospective voting says, essentially, is that you don't need to have much in the way of actual information or knowledge about policy when you vote. All you really need to know is, are things going reasonably well uh, under the current incumbent administration or Congress? If things are going well, then you vote for the incumbents and you reelect them, you reward them for the good outcome. If, on the other hand, things are going badly, then you vote the bastards out. You vote in a new set of bastards, and a new set of bastards is on notice that they have to produce better results. Otherwise, you can vote them out too. Uh, so the idea is that even if the voters don't know much about the details of policy, uh, this gives politicians incentives to produce good results in office, and it economizes on information. I think there are actually situations uh, where retrospective voting works well. In particular, it works well when there is a large and obvious disaster that has occurred of some sort, one that can be pinned on the incumbent administration, can be held responsible for it, uh, and then you can punish them at the ballot box and indeed create the sorts of good incentives uh, that I just mentioned. So for example, research shows that no democracy has ever had a mass famine on its own territory. Why? Well, retrospective voting is surely part of the story here. Uh, if a mass famine does occur, even relatively ignorant voters will tend to notice that it's going on. They're likely to blame the incumbent political leadership and vote them out of office. Uh, and that gives incumbents pretty good example, pretty good incentives to avoid mass famines uh, and other similar disasters that are easy to understand and trace the incumbents. I think this is a good thing and it's a valuable attribute of democracy. But unfortunately, most political issues uh, don't work this way, and in most of them, you have to have more knowledge in order to engage in retrospective voting effectively. Uh, so one problem, as I previously mentioned, is that often uh, voters don't even know about the existence of important policies, such as the Bush prescription drug bill. And that makes it hard for them to assess their results if you don't even know that the policy has been enacted. There are also many policies out there which are relatively hidden and hard to detect, and therefore voters are just unaware of them. And, and therefore can't trace their results back to the incumbents. For example, uh, there are often many hidden taxes and subsidies uh, that exist in the uh, political system, both in Europe uh, and in the United States. Furthermore, uh, in deciding whether to credit or blame incumbents for results that occur in the world, it's important to know which results are actually affected by government policies and which ones are not. And as I mentioned previously, very often voters blame incumbents for things that they didn't cause, such as short-term economic trends, conditions in the world economy, bad weather, shark attacks, the list can go on and on. Uh, it sometimes is the case that local Local politicians actually gain votes uh, when the local sports team wins an important championship or victory because there's sort of a good feeling. People, all oh, things are going well, and you know I'll vote for the incumbent. Uh, obviously. Uh, except in very rare cases, such as the, uh, you know, such as a few that could have can be cited, uh, politicians actually do not cause uh, local sports team victories. In addition, 
often people are not evaluating the current record in any kind of rational or unbiased way. So people don't often look at just an objective set of facts and say, well, the incumbents can be credited or blamed for this. Rather, often what people think the facts are are significantly affected by how they feel about the incumbents rather than vice versa. So for instance, studies show that when a Democrat is in office, uh, committed Republicans tend to think that inflation and unemployment are significantly higher than they actually are. Similarly, when a Republican is in office, it's the Democratic voters who think that inflation and unemployment are unusually high and Republicans who tend to underestimate it. And there's many other examples uh, of similar bias of this type. Uh, so rational irrationality also affects retrospective voting. It's not just ignorance alone. Uh, much more can be said on this, and I say it in the book. For now, I think the key point is this, that while these shortcuts do have some value, uh, they, uh, it's their, their value is, under, is overestimated, and often the shortcuts can actually make things worse if you evaluate the information that you have in an irrational way, or if you simply don't have the pre-existing knowledge that you need to evaluate the information uh, correctly. Now, another argument that is made for the irrelevance of political ignorance, uh, one that is perhaps less familiar or less intuitive, is the so-called miracle of aggregation. And this argument says, let's say even that shortcuts don't work very well uh, and that the vast majority of the public is ignorant, uh, it still perhaps doesn't matter under the following conditions. So let's say in the current presidential election, most people are ignorant about the policies and positions of Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, uh, perhaps it doesn't matter. Yes, there will be millions of people perhaps who choose to vote for Romney based on a mistaken understanding of his positions, uh, but there will be a similar uh, number of people who choose to vote for Obama uh, based on other misunderstandings, and it all will tend to balance out. For every uh, person who, who mistakenly votes for Romney, there will be others who mistakenly vote for Obama, and over a large number of people with millions of voters, this will tend to balance out. And so so the ignorant people who vote for Romney will be offset by the ignorant people who vote for uh, Obama because of their lack of knowledge. Uh, and really, the election will be determined by the small, knowledgeable minority because these ignorant people will offset each other and all be awash. I think it's a little bit ironic that this argument is cited as a defense of democracy and voter knowledge because, of course, what the theory suggests is that uh, the votes of 80 or 90 percent of the public or even more are actually irrelevant. We could deny the franchise to them and instead limit it to the small knowledgeable minority would get the exact same result, except that we will save some time and money uh, on tens of millions of ignorant people going to uh, the polls. Uh, in any case, however, the aggregation argument rests on assumptions that turn out to be false. One key false assumption is the idea that uh, the mistakes for one side will be offset by mistakes for the other. In reality, there's no reason to believe that this will occur uh, because there are many, many issues out there where a mistake in one direction is more intuitive easier to grasp uh, than a mistake in the other direction. For instance, it turns out that it is much easier to uh, and more intuitive for people to blame uh, incumbents for economic conditions that they didn't cause than for people to make the opposite mistake uh, of uh, giving people too little blame for current economic conditions. Uh, the former mistake is just more intuitive, more plausible to many more people. Uh, in addition, the aggregation argument predicts that if you increase political knowledge, it actually won't matter because uh, the people, uh, because the effects of the ignorance that it cures were random to begin with. It turns out, however, that numerous studies show that uh, when you control for other variables such as a person's background, their ideology, their age, gender, and many other things, uh, when you increase their knowledge, uh, people do change their minds on average on many issues, and that suggests that previous mistakes uh, or previous effects of ignorance were not just random uh, in their impact. Uh, libertarians would be happy to know 
that on a wide range of issues, uh, if you control for other variables, increased political knowledge leads people to be more socially liberal and more fiscally conservative. Now, I hasten to add that does not mean that people with high political knowledge become libertarian. Most of them don't. Rather, they become more libertarian than they would have been otherwise. This isn't true on all issues. For instance, taxes are a big exception. People who know more about politics uh, tend to be more supportive of the argument for taxes, probably because it's more counterintuitive uh, than the argument against them. Uh, in any case, whether they become more libertarian or not, uh, knowledge does not have just a random impact. And that suggests that the impact of ignorance is also not random uh, and systematic. Uh, finally, there is this important point. Even if aggregation works perfectly with regard to the choices actually before the electorate, say the choice between Obama and Romney, the advocates of the miracle of aggregation ignore the fact that the ignorance, its effect is not just in the decisions people make between the alternatives before them, uh, it also affects what those alternatives are going to be in the first place. So if you had a much more knowledgeable electorate, it's very likely you would have different candidates. Perhaps Obama and Romney wouldn't be the options or even if they were, the policy platforms they run on would likely be very different. They would be catering to a much more knowledgeable electorate, one that's more difficult to fool, one that has a better understanding uh, of the effects of policies. Uh, so uh, I think it's important to recognize that uh, political ignorance not only determines to some extent the decisions we make as to the choices before us, uh, but they also in, in many cases have an impact uh, on what those choices are in the first place. So what are some of the implications uh, of this problem of political knowledge uh, for the sort of government that we should have? Uh, well, if the core problem here is that it's rational for people to be ignorant and also rational for people to give illogical evaluations of the information they do have, uh, then it would be desirable to make more of our decisions in settings uh, where people's incentives are less perverse, where they have incentives to acquire more information and to do a better job of evaluating the information they have. Uh, and it turns out that when people vote with their feet as opposed to at the ballot box, they do in fact have better incentives, whether that voting with your feet be voting in the market or civil society, or voting with your feet in the federal system where you try to determine which jurisdiction you want to live on, whether in Virginia, for instance, or Maryland, or New York, uh, or the like. Uh, think about uh, your decision to buy the last car or the last TV uh, that you purchased. Uh, did you spend more time on that and more effort on that, uh, or did you spend more time and effort acquiring information about the last time you voted in a presidential election? Uh, if you're like me and the vast majority of other people, you probably spent more time and effort on the car. Is that because you think that uh, your car is more important than who becomes president of the United States? Probably not. It's rather because when you choose to purchase a car, you know that your decision will be decisive. That is, uh, you don't have to take a vote with a million other people where a majority decides which car you purchase. Rather, you yourself are a decisive voter or you and your spouse, perhaps. And therefore, you take the decision more seriously and you try to uh, get more information and evaluate it in a logical way. Uh, because you know it will actually be decisive. Moreover, it's not just you acquire more information, but you're more logical in the way that you evaluate it. Consider this. It is considered bad manners in most social circles to criticize someone else's political opinions. Right? People don't like it. They get mad at you. On the other hand, if you point out that a person's evaluation of a car that they might buy is flawed or a TV, uh, the social norms against this are much weaker. And often, people are actually happy when you point this out to them. Why? I think a big part of the difference uh, is that people know that when they're buying a car or a TV, the decision is decisive, so they're willing to put up with more criticism of their views because they know that that criticism might actually uh, improve the outcome for them. On the other hand, people don't like to put up with criticism of their political views, in part because they intuitively sense that even though it does give them some additional information, perhaps uh, the chance that information will be useful to them or make a better decision or a better impact on the world is very low. Uh, so 
uh, so in effect, when people criticize your political views, you get the annoyance of being criticized, but you get very little payoff. And that's part of the reason why it tends to violate social norms, or rather why social norms uh, tend to frown upon this kind of criticism, but not on criticism of other kinds of uh, non-political decisions where your decision is more likely uh, to be decisive. Uh, so this, I think, uh, strengthens the case for making more decisions in the market and in civil society, where although certainly we're not completely rational and we do make mistakes, and certainly we never have perfect information, the incentive to acquire information and the incentive to use it and evaluate it in a rational way is much stronger than it is when we vote uh, at the ballot box. Uh, with respect to the government that we do have, uh, this strengthens the case for decentralizing political authority so that we can vote with our feet. Uh, if, we're ch if we don't like the policies of Virginia, uh, the state where I currently live, uh, we have the option of moving to many other jurisdictions. Or if we don't like our local government, we have other choices. Uh, whereas if we don't like the policies of the federal government, the only way to uh, get out from under it is to leave the United States entirely, which is much more costly uh, and difficult. Uh, and there's a lot of historical evidence that when people vote with their feet uh, in a federal system uh, or in and through immigration, uh, they often make quite rational and effective decisions, even in situations where information acquisition is difficult uh, and where uh, the costs uh, of, of getting it are higher than they were today. So for instance, 100 years ago, millions of African Americans in the South, where they were highly oppressed at the time, learned that they could move to the North, where the policies were relatively less favorable, and made good and correct decisions about that, even though their levels of education were very low, and even though the cost of acquiring information uh, in that era was significantly higher than it would be today when we have the internet and when people are on average more educated. Or think of the millions of Europeans and Asians and others who moved to the United States in the 19th century, correctly deducing the conditions were better there than in their homelands, even though many of them were illiterate, had low levels of education. Obviously, there certainly wasn't any internet where you could just Google United States and economic conditions and find out. Uh, that incomes and other opportunities were uh, higher in America uh, than in your home country. So I think the key implications here uh, is that because in markets and civil society and voting with your feet, uh, you have much better information incentives and you have incentives to act more rationally when you get the information, that strengthens the case for limited and decentralized government. Now, I hasten to add that this doesn't definitively prove by itself what uh, amount of government we should have or how centralized it should be. There are obviously considerations other than political ignorance which also matter. What I am suggesting, however, is that political ignorance should be a much bigger part of the debate on the size, scope, complexity, and centralization of government than it currently is. So the next time you think about whether a particular issue should be decided by government or should be left to markets and civil society, one of the factors that you want to consider is, do you believe that this is the kind of issue that will be handled well by a largely ignorant electorate? Perhaps in some instances, your answer will be yes. But I think in a wide range of cases, the answer will be no, or at the very least, you have very serious doubts uh, about whether this is really the kind of thing that we want to throw into the arena of political ignorance. Uh, so on that note, I conclude, but I hope that I have succeeded in at least somewhat increasing your knowledge about ignorance. Thank you.